Hello there, you beautiful people. I've got a question for you. Do you drink coffee or tea? Of course you do, you beautiful bastard. And that is precisely why I want to tell you about my sponsor, Twin Engine Coffee. Twin Engine Coffee grows and roasts specialty-grade coffees right on the farms in Central America. And guess what? If you happen to be a snob like me and are much too pretentious to drink coffee, you can enjoy some Keturah tea, my personal favorite, which is made from the dried fruit of the coffee plant. You take you some ginger root, a couple lemon slices, some honey, and a dash of cayenne powder, and you'll have an even sexier concoction than all the hipsters tapping away at their laptops at that high-end cafe around the corner. So again, if you enjoy great coffee or tea, support small business and this podcast by ordering from twinenginecoffee.com slash Clifton Duncan. Again, that is twinenginecoffee.com slash Clifton Duncan. There's a link in the show notes below. And now, enjoy the show. And I tried to reason, and I tried to talk about, I mean, I really opened myself up. I talked about the near death of my son and myself and childbirth, you know, really big stuff, you know, um, to no avail. They were, they were very, very, I mean, deeply offended by the fact that I thought sex was real and I actually said it and and, and would not just back down. I would, would, was like, well, explain to me how it's possible to change sex. Explain this to me. I want to know. There must be evidence and facts. Uh, I'm not against that. I, I'm willing to be kind, but I'm also not willing to lie. That's right. just not, I can't do it. this is it as artists we're all we're always meant to be like well I always have been like four or five steps ahead so you know I, I won't I won't say loads but it was almost inevitable that I was gonna get cancelled because I'm just like oh I can see this coming oh here it is it's still shocking when it happens um but you're right there's so many stories they're so similar there's right. literally a pl playbook for them yet still people are not getting it and you're like come on people get it get it get over it move on yeah, well, I think it's well. Look, let me. We're, we're already off to the races. So I'm gonna do, my, off, yeah. I'm gonna do my, my silly my silly intro, and then we're just gonna jump right on into it. Um, well, hello there, ladies, gentlemen, and as always, everyone in between. Uh, my name is Clifton Duncan. This is my podcast. Uh, you have found us once again for a wonderful, exciting conversation with a guest that I I just. Um, I'm already deeply in love uh, with her, but uh, she's happily married with with children. So I, I you know, uh, there's also a sort of distance thing going on as well. So I, I can't really do anything. She, And I think she has more integrity than to get involved with a scoundrel like me. But we'll get to all that later. Um, if you are watching this on YouTube, uh, please like, share, and subscribe. If you love it, share it with your friends. If you hate it, then share it with your enemies. And let's go off to the races. Now, uh, my guest today, I, I was I was telling her offline, and uh, I'm glad I get to use the pronoun her. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, I feel very full right now. I'm also very sort of out of my depth uh, because I'm an actor speaking to uh, to a dancer. But then I realized, you know what? There there was a, a point in around 2014 where I just did a bunch of shows where um, I, as an actor, was being called upon to dance, and the dancers were being called upon to act. And it was really funny to see how. <laughs> How we were like, how do you do what you do? Um, so, you know, I, I hope to learn a lot. I hope you all get to learn a lot. And uh, and I'm happy to uh, introduce you to this amazing, amazing individual. Uh, Miss Kay, could you please, please, please introduce yourself to my uh, to my fine audience? Um, hello, fine audience. Um, uh, <laughs> hello, Clifton. Um, my name's Hi Rosie Kay. <laughs> I'm a choreographer and dancer. And I suppose speaker now as well. <laughs> Now, now, Rosie has a very interesting story, and uh, we, we'll we'll get to that um, her her cancellation. She's spoken about it before. Um, you know, we we we're we're sort of weary of these kinds of stories. Um, they're indicative of a larger problem, but uh, it is I think it is important to understand 
sort of how we came into contact and uh, the sort of atmosphere that's taking place uh, in the arts right now. But first and foremost, um, Madame K, what is it that drew you to dance in the first place? It's so it's so hard. <laughs> You're right, and, and and I was thinking about it today because I I was doing my ballet bar, you know, and there's still things that I'm like, oh, curse you, hip, curse you, feet, you know. Um, I I supposedly like according to family legend, um, I started dancing at the age of three, wow. and um, I was quite picky about which dance school I wanted to go to. Um, and my mum said that was quite strange because they went to the expensive one where everyone was in beautiful ballet uniforms. And I said, no, 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 they're, they're pretending to dance. They're not actually dancing. And then she found, you know, she had to go to a couple more and then she found like a really a good school where the teaching was brilliant and it was very imaginative. And I was quite lucky through my childhood to, to find really, really good teachers who taught discipline and taught the hard work, but also taught the beauty of the imagination and the creation with it as well. I, th I think there's a, a, just on the side, there's a little sad note there because, um, which also almost relates a little bit to the issues I found myself into, which was that my brother died um, almost exactly a year and a month before I was born. So hmm. in the seventies, if a, if a child, a baby, well, he was a toddler died, um, mothers were told to have a baby as quick as possible, you know, replace the loss. And so I think wow. I was born into, you know, quite a, a, a middle class, a very traditional Scottish family, dealing with death, dealing with grief, very, you know, sort of buttoned up, um, unemotional openly, but all these emotions going on under the surface. And so for me to dance and to cheer everybody up, but also to kind of pull in all those feelings and 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 all that stuff that must have been going on even between my parents never mind my my older sister um I think for me it was a way to, to sort of exist amongst something that I didn't understand and I could probably never understand mm. and I think that also gave me a little bit this sense it, it, it wasn't terribly um encouraged that I went into a career like dance I think my parents wanted me to do something more traditional like law or history um, and, and I fought against the whole female stereotype of going into dance I, because I I understood its grit and its toughness and not just the athleticism and the physical, you know, discipline of it, but also the intellectual and emotional side. And I always felt like, well, yes, if I was a boy, would I want to do this? But I always wondered what would my brother do and could I get away with as much if I were a boy or could I get away with more if I were a boy? So there was always mm. this sense of this missing brother there in my life as well. So then, I, just, I, I love you already. Um, you, you mentioned that there were people who were pretending to dance versus people who, who were dancing. And so then my, my immediate question then is, is what is, what is dance to you? What, what to you constitutes a dancer, like a true, a true dancer? And it is like the thing, whether I be with professionals or on a film set or uh, in, on, on a live event or something, it is that thing. And it's so hard, you can't put a value on it, you can't put money on it. It is something to do with the connection of the body, the mind and the soul. Mm. And, and, and you can't force it, you can't demand it. There are tricks <laughs> to elicit it. Uh, there, are, there are tricks that I found using my personality, but, but ultimately it's a magic. It's a magic and, and, and that, I can see it, I can feel it, I can smell it, but I can't deliver it without really getting in there and finding it. It's fascinating because, um, you know, part of my journey over the past couple of years has been, um, and I sort of frame it in the journey of a, a teacher named Uta Hagen, who was a very uh, well-known American acting teacher who, she wrote a book called Respect for Acting. And uh, at the beginning of it, she relates this tale of how she had reached a point in her career where she was successful. She's working on Broadway, getting great reviews and everything, but she felt really dead in her work and that she was relying on tricks um, and uh, cliches. You know, we, we always try to avoid uh, cliche modes of expression uh, in, in the work that we do. And um, she said it wasn't until she met a, a director named Harold Clerman that 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 uh, really pushed her to 
to revisit her work in a new way and and to use more of herself her genuine self maybe even her her, her soul in a new in a new way and uh, to reach a, a new level of truth that she really began that became reinvigorated and excited about her work and so just listening to you um, it, it makes me think about the sort of journey I've been on, this idea of the soul. I know you've said before that uh, you're working in a piece called Five Soldiers, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, I mean, I think you said um, you said that the, the where is the soul in, in, in the body? And for me, I'm someone who, you know, I've, I've uh, been pretty staunchly atheistic for quite some time. But um, within the past few years, I've, I've, I've come to wonder if perhaps art and artists um, can in an increasingly secular society um, create those kinds of maybe divine experiences if i can be so lofty that um, that perhaps we're, we're missing right now I, don't, I mean what do you think about that i don't know because you're the one talking about soul and and by, i mean which it's, it's just on my wavelength right now where i'm going you know well yeah there's a couple of things what one um i learned transcendental meditation quite young because i got i got glandular fever when i was at dance school and mm -hmm. um that turned into chronic fatigue syndrome and it felt like I would never have energy ever again and so a friend recommended TM and I've been doing it on and off now for oh goodness knows like 20 odd years and, I, and actually I was just I was meditating earlier and I was thinking oh you know I've put in all this hard work you know on my body on my soul and my meditation and this happened to me and then I was like, oh, hang on, because, you know, this conscious brain is still there. And then it was like, no, hang on, maybe this happened to you exactly because you'll be meditating and you're aware and you're not going to say the things that everybody else is telling you that you have to say. I kind of missed that out because I was on this other journey, maybe selfishly thinking that my religion was art. So I'm a little bit like the other way around now at the moment. I'm like going art is not religion and mm. what does religion do to society what's it what's it been holding together that by getting rid of it or going very much more secular um like you I probably I, I thought I was an atheist now I'm, I'm questioning that myself actually mm. what what are those frameworks of religion that do to say help women coexist with men safely mm. to put boundaries and parameters around different phases of our lives so that they don't blur you know now now I'm actually on a slight religious quest at the moment as well so mm. <laughs> yeah yeah well it's it's just it's fascinating you know you hear conservatives talk all the time about the the god-shaped hole in society and for the longest time I've just been like yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> you know you know sure yeah. sure but um you know, but I think over time for me, I began to feel like, um, you know, even though I sort of kept my my belief system intact, I'd, I'd said, well, you know, there is some utility, it seems to me, um, to religion in terms of providing some sort of a moral code, um, you know, stories from the Bible, um, and, and as, as far as providing wisdom or a certain framework for, uh, on which you can live your life. Um, even the understanding that, uh, I mean, they, they might call it sin, but that humans are flawed and they're sort of born that way. And I sort of for a while, I was like, that's such a that's such a, a horrible and dour way to to view humanity. But, uh, you know, yeah. but then at the same time, I'd be reading all these old plays, right, all this old literature and doing research around these roles and these period pieces. And, and you find that, uh, you know, even though cultures change, technology changes or whatever, um, mores change. But what's motivated us as human beings has done so for thousands and thousands of years. We haven't really changed all that much. You know, there's all those flaws, all those rough edges, um, the, the horrific things we do to each other. Um, you know, it's it's um, it's it's just once I began to sort of make those connections, I was like, well, maybe, you know, maybe maybe they're on to something. But I think also this this idea of. Um, having uh, uh, or creating a more transcendental kind of experience for people. Um, what is it when you're in an audience and you're, and you're experiencing a, um, a piece that's really moving and deeply moving to you, or it's just so beautiful, or it fills you with awe? Like, what is that? And do you even want to articulate it or sort of, you know, try to concretize it? But like, you know, but is, is it akin at all to maybe a religious experience? And that's sort of what the kick I've been I, I don't I'm not settled on the in the answers yet, but I am curious, like, you know, is is there something to that? You know, I think it seems like something uh, seems like I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm, I'm like stuttering over my words, um, but it seems like we might be sort of in the same 
wavelength in a way, you know? I, I think I think they touch and they and they possibly overlap, but they are separate things. I, I think um like having a child and watching mm. how he pretends and and play act from a very, very early age. So it's 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 almost as they're forming language itself comes the playing of roles and the imaginary mm. world. And and I remember sort of watching him and going, ah, so these aren't separate phases. This is at the very genesis of both the sense of self, um, the sense of language, the sense of communication, and play and creativity and imagination. Mm. Like it's all happening around that sort of two, 18 months, two and a half years old. And so I think like what, if we go back to like the ancient Greeks or something, like what, what, what theatre is doing to us is, is giving us the space to reflect I think the heights and depth of humanity at us mm. and give us the time and the option to go, well, it, well if I was playing whoever, Medea, <laughs> maybe I'd react differently or maybe I could possibly imagine what it must feel like to want to murder my children or something. And I think that's what you're talking about, like that, that little sense of like good and evil. Can we put ourselves into another person's shoes, good or bad, and question these things? I'm not sure religion is, doing that I, I mean I, I'm not a theologian and and but, right. but I, I do remember like something that Andrew Sullivan said who's, who's, who's a Catholic um that stuck with me was that often people only start to really think about religion when they've experienced something that they feel is evil and I think <laughs> I think that's quite an interesting point that we sort of see it as oh yeah you know happy clappy airy fairy but once we sense something that we think is evil that's where we go oh Oh, that's maybe where religion is. Yeah, that, that's so crazy because you know I've, I've said multiple times that I I've I've not used uh, the word evil more than I have in the past two and a half years. Just so, some of the things that I've seen and and, and witnessed, and uh, you know, I, and and even words like soul. I'm like these people are just really soulless. Like, what is going on right now? You know, people are. <laughs> People are suffering all over the place, and and people, uh, you, you don't seem to care about that. And I don't know what what to what to um, what to make of it. Um, I'm going to change gears a little bit now, and we're going to talk about something that you don't want to talk about. I know. Um, so Rosie and I were talking about before online. Uh, so so she she got canceled. I won't I won't spoil anything. Um, but we uh, were talking about what what happened and um, and how just sort of exhausted we are talking about these kinds of things as artists because uh, it's so it's so frequent now, um, or these stories are becoming so prevalent, and there's a whole outrage machine out there, and uh, we're we're. We're less interested in that now, um, as far as uh, at least this show is. Um, you know, we want to we want to want to try to elevate the conversation more. And uh, and you know, if I can serve as an ambassador to, to the arts, you know, and, and bring you interesting people, then that's what we want to do. But um, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned before that uh, you sort of were on this wavelength where you were. Um, when people, you know, you sort of naturally bucked against this idea of people trying to tell you what to say. And that kind of got you in a little bit of hot water, it seems like. Just a bit. Yeah, <laughs> just, just, I mean, just, just, a, yeah, just a bit. And, and and I think what also, what made me think was like, like we're sort of like the tip of the iceberg because I think mm. we're sort of two people that have either gone public or, or just not shut up about it. Uh, I actually yeah. know a lot more, a lot more artists who have either just, quietly disappeared, immigrated or retired. And it's tragic yes. because we're losing really Brilliant seriously people. good artists. Yes. Like the best, like the best. Well, it's, because, it's, well, it's it's people that that you want who who would challenge, you know, the, the challenge perspectives, who will speak out against stuff, who have integrity, um, who aren't yeah. afraid of confrontation and conflict, yeah. who, um, who, are, who are thinking outside the box, who are outside the status quo. Like you want people like that to be in your industries and they're purging that right now. So for people who don't know, can you just kind of recount what happened to you just so we get it out of the way? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, so, so I was doing a production of Romeo and Juliet um, it was a contemporary setting based in modern Birmingham, uh, the city I have adopted and lived in the past 20 years. And um, I'd been researching it for about five years and then it got delayed and then it, COVID had hit and then it got delayed again. And so I auditioned really very, I wanted them as young as possible. So they were like young, inexperienced dancers, had, maybe hadn't even done their graduation show because of COVID and taking them, doing this massive 
massive Romeo and Juliet on one of the biggest stages in the UK. Um, and it's a big show and we've got COVID rules and it's really weird. Like we're not even allowed to touch for more than 10 minutes in any hour and a maximum three hours to a day. You're doing a love, you're doing Romeo and Juliet. I mean, Romeo. dance. <laughs> like, you know, you couldn't do any of those trust exercises, those touch exercises, everything that's like, you know, my bread and butter to build that vibe, to build that magic, nothing. And there was a funny vibe. I could just feel it. I now look back and I think it's because I was the director and choreographer and they were feeling the oppression of that situation. But yeah. I was like totally um, very democratic. It was very task-based, it was very imaginative. It was lots of like, let's tell the story. I was doing, you know, it was, it, was, it was good, but it was weird. And I put that down to COVID. So I invited the full cast of Nine Dancers to my house um, on a Saturday night. I'd spent two days preparing all the different meals, the gluten-free and the vegetarian and uh, all the rest of it. Um, they came, um, I showed them around my house, uh, they played with my son in the garden, it was a lovely warm evening, we had dinner outside. Um, my husband did try to kick them out about 1.30 a.m. because my, my son has swimming, you know, early in the morning on a Sunday. Um, but we were all having fun and kicking back and they were like, oh my God, Rosie, you're, like, you're having wine and a cigarette and I'm like, hell yeah, you know. Um, and it was all very lovey, lovey, as it, as it, as it, you know, as it is with loveys. Um, and then they asked what my next show was, and I was two years of prep into our adaptation of Virginia Woolf's Orlando, and it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant tour de force of a book by Virginia Woolf. And the eponymous hero Orlando starts off as a very wet aristocrat, um, and halfway through the novel, he transforms into a woman. He's a woman. Nothing really changes. It's still Orlando. Orlando is still going around in the world, but the world treats Orlando completely differently. Um, and by the way, Orlando lives for about 400 years and never perceivably ages. So it's a, it's a magic, you know, super, reali super unrealistic book. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And the argument started on, well, this has to be played by a trans person. And I was like, well, what, you know, somebody that's male that thinks I feel, like, yeah, how's that? has actually worked because it's somebody that's got to be actually believable in both, but it's also a play on all this, you know, it's, 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 it's a comedy <laughs> hmm. and it just ramped up super, super quickly. Cause I, I mean, I mean, I saw this stuff coming over the hill quite a few years ago. I actually came in at it through conspiracy theory and transhumanism, but then I quickly picked up what was happening in the women's rights movement and really intelligent women, really intelligent women pointing out what the longer term, bigger implications could be. If we erase sex as a character, uh, as, a, as a protection, a characteristic of protection, we erase women's sort of ability to participate freely in society or safeguards where women are vulnerable. Um, so I was aware of this and I was just, I probably started a little bit cheeky, like, well, we all, you know, we all, come on, we know. And then, it, I mean, it was like, I, I mean, I actually met, you know, the activists, you know, face to face. Um, and I had no, I had no idea. I thought I was in trusted company. I thought we were in a trusted space. I thought it was a private home and we were talking. Um, it got a bit nasty. I think I hid upstairs at one point and I was just gonna go to bed, but I thought that would be rude. And then I went back down. <laughs> I tried to smooth everyone. There was like people shouting at me, but there were other people that were clearly getting like unsafe by this conversation and very hurt. And I tried to reason, uh, tried to talk about, I mean, I really opened myself up. I talked about the near death of my son and myself and childbirth, you know, really hmm. big stuff, you know, um, to no avail. They were, they were very, very, I mean, deeply offended by the fact that I thought sex was real and I actually said it and 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 would not just back down. I would was like, well, explain to me how it's possible to change sex. Explain this to me. I want to know. There must be evidence and facts. Uh, I'm not against that. I, I'm willing to be kind, but I'm also not willing to lie. Right. That's just not, I can't do it. Um, I thought it would blow over. I, I did but it did put me in a really scared place because I had a big show to put on in 10 days. 
Mm. And that it's like your choreographer's worst nightmare. If you lose the energy and the imagination in the room, you know, you've got a dead show, no, no question. So I asked my chair, who had been a friend for a long time, to step in and help smooth it down. But then I discovered that they'd had gendered training. And so it quickly became apparent to me that it, they all thought they were right and I was the witch to be burnt. It became apparent quite quickly. Hmm. So I tried to just be really like, okay, let's just be, let's do everything by the book. I, I've never had a complaint before. Let's, let's, let's do everything by policy. I did one investigation that lasted for six weeks um, and I was exonerated, but then one dancer appealed and they started my company, my company started bringing in their own lawyers using my money and it all got really big and really serious and really nasty. And so I had to bring in my own lawyers and it soon became apparent that they had thrown the grievance and the complaints policy out the window and they were just absolutely going for me. And um, I got two, two opinions and I resigned citing constructive dismissal as in they were not fulfilling their side as employers to me and they were discriminating against me for simply stating beliefs that by law in Britain are now protected, um, thanks to Mayor Forstarter. So a woman saying that she believes that sex is real is protected under law, but they had not, they were not applying that law to me. <sighs> that is quite, <laughs> that is quite the story. I mean, you know, I, I... You, you mentioned um, conspiracy theory and transhumanism um, sort of gave you a window into that. Did, did, did I mishear you or is that, uh, how so? I'm very curious about that. So I started researching like cover-ups um, around 2012 after uh, there was a really famous British uh, children's TV presenter called Jimmy mm. Savile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it became apparent after he died that there'd been a huge cover-up and by investigating him, I discovered this whole, like, the, the sort of rabbit hole of conspiracy theory. Some of it was cover-ups, some of it was pure conspiracy theory, and some of it was blurry and, 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 and really weird imaginations of the world, you know, going back 10 years ago. So I just kept digging and digging, and I discovered this thing called um, M MK Ultra, which is a real... CIA brainwashing program where they right. they they thought that they could like change people's brains and, and and reprogram people. Of course you can't, it really harms people. But but millions and millions and millions of pounds were spent on this and they had to pay out millions and millions of pounds of compensation all across like America, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand. And then it was when I found the link between um, conspiracy theory and pop stars that that people like Britney Spears had possibly un undergone MK Ultra. I thought there was something really exciting there. So around 2014, 15, I was trying to get, trying to find academics that were looking at conspiracy theory, because I was like, this is a huge phenomenon. And I was doing interviews with like uh, teenagers and young people, so like under 25. And they were describing this world in which they both believed and didn't believe these conspiracy theories. And they were talking a lot about distrust of society. Mm. There's quite a good website at, at, at you know at the time. I mean, the poor conspiracy theorists are out of work right now because it's gone, it's gone main, you know, it's 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 it's, it's we're in it. <laughs> um, but there's one called Vigil Vigilant Citizen, and he was doing updates, um, and every now and again he'd pick up on the transhumanism. Um, and I was just and the androgyny and the and the you know, men into girls and girls, and and I thought, mm, interesting, you know, that sort of fashion sort of look, yeah, that's quite interesting, but that's mm. not gonna go mainstream that's that'll never take off that'll never take off. <laughs> <laughs> so around like by 2017 i was like oh this is like you know starting to come through and then by then i'd started to pick up the the, the feminists on twitter starting to say hang on this is actually happening in our mental health you know uh, places like the tavistock in in london which has just been under review so you know, finally, where are we five years later, that's starting to be exposed. So, so you could say that I think we're living, we've been living in a little bit of a transgender cover up in terms of like, how, how it won't get out into the mainstream, what's actually been happening. 
It's a, it's so fascinating. You know, it's one of those issues where, um, you, you know, here in in the states, people they they. I think a lot of people just sort of they, they say live and let live, and you know, you do your thing. Just don't hurt anybody. Don't hurt me. Um, don't bother me. Um, it, it, and I think people try to be as tolerant and as accepting as possible. But um, this this is, I think this is like one issue, maybe, or I won't say the issue, but it certainly is a, like a crucial issue that it's just, it, it that it, it crosses a lot of lines for people. It creates a lot of boundaries for people because you are talking about the very essence really of, of who we are as human beings. Um, and you know certainly there must be a world that that can exist where sexual minorities can can live unmolested and unharassed and have all their rights and freedoms and we also preserve the idea of sexual dimorphism which which really isn't an idea it just is you know and it and especially when it comes to art you know i'm i'm thinking about your work in like five soldiers for instance and for those who um, well you know i'll let you, i'll let you talk about uh, about five soldiers um for a little bit and what then well, because well, yeah, go for it, go for it. Well, well, well uh, where, where, where should I, where should I start? I mean, well, because well, go, well, for those who don't know, it's a, um, it's a piece about five soldiers, and um, but what's interesting about it, uh, you know, and they're going off to war. We we see them, uh, you know, in, in training, and then they get into battle, and then uh, you know things happen. And what what was fascinating about it to me, especially within uh, the bounds of this conversation, is that there's four men and there's one woman in it, and. The thing for me is that um, if you eliminate, I think about, I think about like Othello, for instance, um, the, the, the end of that play, um, like they, they tried to do like a non-binary Othello here in the States, at some small theater. And, you know, that's fine. But here's the thing. If I'm playing that role, I'm six foot three, I'm like 200 pounds and I'm choking my co-star to death. It's going to have a visceral impact on the audience, especially if it's done really, really well, right? Yeah. And you don't get that if you have some like five foot nine sort of genderless person um, doing the same thing. It's not to be rude. It's just it doesn't have, I think, on a primordial level, it doesn't have the same impact. And what I loved about uh, uh, Five Soldiers is the interplay between the, the men and the women. And, and there's there's so much rich, uh, um, there's so much uh, uh, potential there for tension and for conflict and, and and for the development of relationships. And you just don't get that if you eliminate the idea of, of sex altogether. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 so so Five Soldiers was like the first part of a trilogy, which I always used to jokingly call things that you're not allowed to talk about at a dinner party, which I. <laughs> <laughs> so part one was uh, the body in war. Um, part two was the body and religion, a piece called There Is Hope, and part three was meant to be part, the body and politics, which became the conspiracy theory piece, which actually was spot on because it was it, it opened just after Trump came in. So suddenly, people that had said I was bonkers, it, it, it opened. But the, fir <laughs> the, fir the first part was was the body and war, and I I I got really badly injured during a show. Um, and was told I would never dance again, and it took me a year to walk again. And following the operation on my left leg, I had this this absolutely vivid vision-like dream where I was lying on a desert battlefield with bombs going off, and my left leg was no longer attached to me. It was lying over there, and my first thought was was oh shit, like that's my leg. But then my second thought was going back to what you said earlier was like, well, is my body my soul? And if I lost my arms and my legs, would I still be rosy? Yes. Would I still want to dance? Yes. So where did the soul reside? And I went downstairs and I, I was limp downstairs. I was staying at my mum and dad's to recover. And I switched on the telly in their kitchen and it was the faces of young men, British men that had been killed in Iraq because the Iraq war was really going off at that point. And I just looked at those young men and I thought, maybe it's not like the movies. Maybe they're not brainwashed. Maybe they love their jobs as much as I love being a dancer. And I'd do anything to get back on stage, but all I'm risking is injury. I'm not risking my life. So how do you train? How do you train someone for the discipline and the rigor where they know that the risk of their job is not just profound life-changing injury, but it actually could be your life. And that was what set me off on this journey. So I, it took me like nearly two years. I convinced a retired um, general. Yeah, you know, I said, there's war poets, there's war artists, there's war photographers, but the medium of a soldier's body, it, a soldier's job is their body. Let me as a choreographer come in and just try and participate as much as possible, 
you know, and, and just try and feel what it feels like. So I, I, I just got this email, turn up, you know, 6 p.m., bring all this kit, list this long. And I turned up and I thought, I was such an idiot. I was like, oh, the army in the UK, it's 10% female now. So for, you know, one in 10 will be a female. I turned up to an all male infantry battalion. <laughs> 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 it was literally the only woman and and, and um you know they, they were great they, the officers were great 6 a.m the next morning we went off we did a four day and night battle training exercise on Dartmoor came back to base we did remembrance stuff I did hockey I did uh physical training outside I joined in on everything I learned to fire a rifle which was like a step I wasn't sure I was going to take but in the end mm. I was like body learn instrument come on try it Turned out to be a really good shot. And then uh. I got invited. <laughs> <laughs> got invited. Well, it's really interesting because it, to really um, target like a sniper, you breathe in, you breathe out, and you squeeze the trigger between heartbeats. Mm. And if you're a performer, you probably listen to your heartbeat more than normal because you have to calm it down sometimes when you're nervous or you're on stage or you're drying up or something. Mm. Um, so I got invited to fight against a rival battalion and then um, we fought in this like fake Afghan village and I was an insurgent. They were training for Afghanistan and um, I got commended for holding back this like, you know, you know, I was the only female fighting. It was it was unbelievable. But it but but it but it probably I mean, I almost had a nervous breakdown afterwards. I mean, it did. It sort of broke something in me and my sense of like who I was and what my relationship to fighting and to war was. And so then I spent quite a bit of time in the rehabilitation centers. And then mm -hmm. the lot that I trained with, they all went out to Afghanistan and that was like the most brutal time in Afghanistan. And they were surviving injuries that would have killed them in Iraq. So then people I knew were coming back with these complex trauma injuries. They were called multiple amputations. So it's like the dream came true on people that I knew. Mm. And there was just this point then the whole UK like, lockdown shut down no one was allowed any access to anything that was going on because it was too controversial um like the public hated the body bags um and i just got in before that lockdown and so i felt like this duty like no matter how how much people are going to tell me i can't do this which they did i have to make a show about this i have to find a way to translate what what a weird what a weird bizarre strange situation young people who are trained to fight find themselves in and what does it do to them what does it do to mm. them forever you know it, it's so fascinating because i was listening to the q a after that as well um and it it, it made me because i've also been asking these questions about uh, you know what is the role of art in a society especially our society right now um you know it took me a long time to become comfortable even calling myself an actor to be honest and i was in new york you know you swing a dead cat by the tail you had an actor upside the head you know <laughs> and um and it, it just listen to that conversation and everything that you just said you, you're taking something that's happening on a global scale on a on a, on a broader scale and you're, you're saying to yourself i have a duty you use the word duty which i, I love i put a liquid you in there duty um <laughs> to <laughs> that's always it. english du duty duty <laughs> your duty um do your duty um but uh, but you felt you had a a a, a duty to tell the stories of of these people and um and then you got you know like military personnel in there as well you, you perform the piece in a in a um what was it called not not a mess hall but drill, a drill 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 hall drill, a drill, drill hall. hall yeah and and for me it was it was it was so gratifying because um I mean, I've certainly had experiences with with uh, with quote unquote lay people. I call them civilians sometimes who aren't in the arts, who are who are so affected by by a, a play that I've done. Um, but you know, it just makes me. And I ask this question all the time. You know, I mean, what what is the role of art in our society? What what can artists achieve and accomplish? It seems so. You know, when when there's global conflict, when you know the economy is cratering, and you know there's crime in your neighborhood. I mean, at least here in the states, um, you know, social uh, connections are are fraying. I mean, what what on earth? Where do we fit in? You know. But this is like something that I'm really um, trying to redefine for myself because I I, I feel like for the past, um, particularly past ten years or so, 
I felt quite clearly that my my art has a slightly prophetic, slightly visionary, slightly reflective uh, stance on society. You know, I, I go, I dig deeply, I research for years, and I, I, I tend to hit the zeitgeist at the right moment with the right show. Like Orlando should have premiered last month and it would have been perfect because a comedy about this right now would be really helpful, actually. And nobody um, else would be making it, by the way. Nobody no, else would have the courage to do it. No, no. But that was that was cancelled. Thanks very much, Rosie K. Dodd's company, for cancelling. <laughs> for cancelling Rosie K. <laughs> 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 um, but 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 what what's happening now, and I'm hearing it more and more from young artists, is they're saying that that they are artist activists, and yeah. they I'll, are. I'll, out I'll there. stop you. I'll do you one better. Actors, they're calling themselves activists. Get the fuck out of here. But please continue. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> don't like that. <laughs> 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 I mean, did you ever hear anything like, like, get all, get over yourself, please, like, please, no, but <laughs> no, and 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 this is like what I want to talk to you about because it's like you can't just like set out in your twenties and go right, that's it, I'm a, I'm an activist and change the world. <laughs> you need right. some craft, you need some discipline, you need some goddamn experience, right? You need to have to do a show when you're puking up in the wings. You have to do a show when you're cats just died you you know you have to right. do a show when there's one person in the audience you know you have to do a show when it's a standing ovation you need to have all those things yeah. for you to learn your craft it's a craft it's not a hobby it's not a political movement it's it's a proper craft and i i really feel strongly about that <laughs> yeah no we're, we're the same and you know i'll tell you and this is sort of out out of uh somewhat of, of a digression, but it's also related, you know, whatever this particular ideology is, I mean, back in 2020, when all of the, uh, the uh, pandemic stuff began, our, our union, uh, the Stage Actors Union, Actors' Equity, sent out this email that said that, uh, you know, the old adage that the show must go on is outdated, you know, it's, it's unsafe and also racist. So, so they're, they're, and you know, even the idea of um, they're the the uh, the Smithsonian. I don't know how much time you spent in the states, but the, the Smithsonian has a um, a subsidiary. It's the African American Museum of of Art, and uh, they put out this ridiculous PDF that, in, that ended up getting so much backlash they had to delete it from their site. But uh, it it basically listed all these elements of white culture, right? And it was yeah. things like discipline, punctuality, um, individualism. And so all of these things, you know, that, that you're talking about, that I'm talking about, that I believe in. I mean, I, I'm, I'm this guy that's like, all right, so you had a bad day. I don't give a fuck. Like, <laughs> we got we got a show to do, you know? Um, yeah. But, yeah. but it's, you know, I mean, I, I heard these people talking about, uh, you know, we shouldn't have to show up um, uh, you know, at, at 10 a.m., like on time, because like, what if you're not ready? And like, that's sort of a, a white way of thinking about things, sort of a European um, mode and, and perspective, like showing up. I'm like, dude, we have a deadline. Sorry, we have an opening night. People are going to be there paying money. I, I, you know, you can show up when you want to, but I'm going to be here <laughs> ready to work. And uh, that, that sort of attitude now, it's so it's becoming so passe and the work is clearly suffering for it. And I, and I look at the younger people now, you know, I haven't been back to my alma mater in a while. Um, but last time I was there, you know, I just, I'm looking at these people. I'm like, I don't even want to work with you. If I find out you're in a show, like, I don't, I don't want to be in the same rehearsal studio with you because they, I mean, I'm going to feel the sort of weird social pressure to not, you know, uh, trip over any, uh, 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 there's a, uh, the British conservative, uh, Douglas Murray calls them trip wires, yeah. you know, like, yeah. I'm not, I, I don't want to step over any of these trip wires. Like, I don't want to put forth this energy to, to keep censoring myself and deadening myself inside, by the way, I, I call it the erosion of the soul, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. just, just to just to help you feel better, because my job is to take off social masks, my job is to is to be exposed and raw and vulnerable. And it, like, that's that's what I'm here to do, but I'm not here to take care of you. You go and and you, if you need a therapist, if you're triggered by everything, then go to your fucking therapist. That doesn't belong in here. We have work to do. A city divided, a family fractured, two brothers caught between past and present. Published by Knopf Books for Young Readers, Berliners, a new novel by National Book Award nominee Vesper Stamper, 
is a riveting story about the rivalry between two brothers living on opposite sides of the Berlin Wall during its construction in the 1960s, and how their complicated legacy and dreams of greatness will determine their ultimate fate. This powerfully prescient and haunting book is a perfect gift for young readers and has a lot to offer to grown-ups as well. But then again, I am biased, as yours truly had the honor and the pleasure of narrating the audio version of this wonderful novel. So please support free-thinking, independent artists and purchase Berliners by Vesper Stamper from your favorite bookseller today. Make sure to check out the link in the show notes below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, whoever made that idea up of like bring your whole self to work. I mean, it, it it's such a confusing one for artists actually because you know you, you don't want absolutely every single problem in the world, but you do want a sense of honesty, of vulnerability, um, of sharing, of, of, right. of this like a genuine, a genuine safe space where where you're allowed to explore. Like, because sometimes the most stupid thing you do actually is the key that unlocks the next thing, you know? Yeah. And so you've got to, you've got to play. You've got to be like childlike and curious. And that means right. like making mistakes or saying things wrong. And I, I completely agree with you. I want, I want my judge to be the audience, possibly the critics as well, you know, in whatever possibly. field that is. But we, we're there. We are, I do feel there's a sense to, to, to serve, not to just serve myself or my, or my ego, um and and i do worry about like in general this idea of like a, a work ethic being completely you know like the whole idea of working for money being a being a sort of like um state sanctioned oppression or something i find that it, really worrying it's a, patri it's a patriarchal capitalist european construct essentially right. which has to be broken down and I don't know how you, you know, and I've said it over and over again, but I don't see anything of um, any significant uh, work of, but that has like permanence and, and staying power being produced by this particular culture right now. I just, I don't see it. No, 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 you're absolutely right. I, I mean, and it really is, it, it's, it's both destructive, it's nihilistic and, and, and it is a bit lazy, it, you know. Very and... lazy. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 that's you know and, and and what's really worrying going back to what we talked about earlier and cancellation is you know we're we're wiping out particularly a generation of really intelligent women who have reached a certain age that are going to say what's true and what's not true you know mostly through their own their own lived experience <laughs> you know we're going to wipe out a generation of artists because theatres art galleries are too worried to put their work on because they say something like lesbians don't have penises you know in their work <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> which which is true again you know uh, and there'll be a, and there'll be like this generation of, of artists and, and and again going back to cancellation I think there are real opportunists there who are going ha 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 we've got rid of the competition we can come in with our new identity that's sort of teflon coated and and we get a foot in the door and people are too scared because we'll complain and complain and complain if they don't let us show our work. And and it's it's done through quite unsavory means. I mean, like my, my family background um, is Scottish and Polish, and my grandfather came uh had to get out of Poland, came down through Eastern Europe, ended up in Scotland, met my granny, fell in love, married, dropped in Arnhem, survived Arnhem disappeared, ended up back in Scotland. He was going to take the whole family back to Poland. My dad was born by then. Mm. But the Iron Curtain came down. Mm. And so I grew up at the dinner table, you know, talking about these things. And it's that idea of like, not only have they like, you know, sort of dispel you, like, like a lot of my family are exterminated in, in, in the death camps. Not mm. only do you have that horror, your neighbours come along and stolen your mahogany table. And it's like, it's my mahogany table. <laughs> You know, they're not just stealing the riches, they're stealing all the um, the means to the riches as well. And, and, and we got here by hard work and discipline. And yet there are some things I would never go back to in the dance world. I'm sure you wouldn't in the theatre world. There were no question there were abuses of power, no question. But but this is this is this is way the other way. This is not this is not an equalizing and a 
you know making the world a better place this this is this is something else completely yeah and uh, you know it's I, I i don't want to work in an industry full of people who complain their way into jobs um that, that you know and and fund people who fundamentally don't prioritize uh, the work and don't prioritize you know the the art um, they're actually prioritizing their ideology, um, you know, yeah. and, and what's, what's happening now. And I've, and I've had this reflected, I mean, maybe it's self-selection people talking, you know, my own people talking back to me, but, but I felt for a long time from a, from a minority standpoint, you know, it, it, now what I'm seeing is people are just sort of, they're seeing, um, you know, more and more black or brown faces or whatever. And they're just like, they kind of roll their eyes now because they, they, they have a sense or they, they sort of reflexively assume that that person is not there because of their their skill or talent or their appeal or ability. They're just there because they're the right skin color. And so that's going to backfire on people like me who, you know, have the chops and the training and actually deserve to be there. And, um, you know, and and also, you know, it 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 it. it it erodes your ability to work. Like once I once I let go of this idea that I had to be a certain way in order to ap to appease uh, a certain audience. You know what I mean? Like oh, like I used to go into stuff being like, oh man, what are white people going to think? Man, what are my black peers going to think if I do this? Yada, yada. Once I let go of that, which is really an offshoot of this sort of you know quote unquote progressive ideology we're talking about, which is so deliberately race conscious. Um, yeah. You know, everything opened up for me. My work got better and. Um, I became more free in terms of the the sort of choices I felt like I could I could uh, I could make and you know I, I just I I can't I I I don't want to work with people who don't who aren't on that wavelength anymore because then it just it it will it, it's going to cripple any kind of um, artistic drive or freedom that I would have you know yeah and 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 that makes me think um, a little bit I I remember like when the whole thing about cultural appropriation sort of came in and 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 I'm 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 a serious researcher but I'm a serious magpie I mean I've been able to travel the world because you can dance anyway and, and I'll pick up the language as best as I can you know like, mm. like it, it, it is a wonderful thing the way that the arts get you help you share culture share food share love share share, share the arts you know it's fabulous when when you're told you have to stay in your lane. You know, I, mm. you know, I did I did an autobiographical solo. I've done you know one autobiographical solo. Is that all I'm meant to do now for the rest of my artistic career? Is that it? Because that's really boring. That is super boring. Who wants to hear about yeah. me? That I mean, not not me. I don't want to. I don't want to do that. I mean, I don't mind doing a solo show, but. <laughs> <laughs> it, <laughs> Yeah, don't lie. Don't lie, Rosie. Don't lie. Don't lie. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. well, it's, well, it's, you know, I'm, I'm glad you actually brought it up because, you know, I, I kind of wanted to talk about it a little bit. It's called a, Adult Female Dancer. Is that correct? Did I, did I mess up the name? Um, well, I'm only, I'm only blinking because I did want to call it Adult Human Female, um, which is the kind of definition of a woman. And right. then I was convinced by management that that was a little bit too, oh, it might get picked up. And so oh, I called it on. adult female dancer. Yeah. Well, you know, it, well, it kind of goes back into what we were talking about, this sort of erasure of, of sex differences, because as I, as I watched it, I was watching it last night and I was so, so deeply moved by it. And um, one thing that I, I kept I, the, the, that 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 was a constant for me as I was watching it as as you were speaking on a level of experience that I have no clue about as a man, and it was such a, I'm I'm someone who really enjoys like slices of life you know what I mean and and um, like like there was a film that came out a few years ago called Lady Bird I think and it was a, a coming of age um, story about uh, this young girl and I realized as I was watching I was like you know I'd never seen a coming of age story from told from a girl's perspective and so you had these like awkward scenes of her like totally falling in love with the the Timothy Chalfant character and him kind of being like after they're done uh, fucking him being like all right I'm going back to you know read my book or whatever and her being kind of devastated by that like all these experiences I'm like oh man you know like I I may have been that guy you know or <clears throat> So I was watching uh, yours and you're talking about a lot of really sensitive uh, subjects and, and in many ways, that's why I, I came in so full today because like you, there's so much about what you do that uh, for me just embodies what I look for in artists in terms of your, your, you know, your, your research, your, your, your consciousness, um, 
you used the word grit earlier, which, you know, it, 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 I, I found the piece very gritty, lots of grit, um, vulnerability, just a fullness. Um, but also I'm like, there's no way a man could do this show. <laughs> you, you know, like it would be, but, and, and, and I'm, and I, I'm happy about that, you know, because it gives me a window into like, into your world, you know, and, and, and if we, if we continue to, it, it's not that, you know, there's not amazing dance pieces to be, uh, you know, or stories to be told about, you know, sexual minorities or non-binary people or whatever, but, you know, we also have to preserve, I think, what, you know, what, what a woman is, because otherwise, I mean, how are you, I don't know, I'm going to shut up, but I just, I just, I was so blown away by, by, by this thing. Cause I, you know, I just, I, I just want to have no, no clue about, you know, the sort of realms of, the, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm just blowing you up right now. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to drink some tea. But like, but what, like, what was the genesis of, the, of that piece? Like, where did it come from? Well, actually, I mean, it's a bit of a funny story because um, we were, um, we were doing a US tour of Five Soldiers in spring 2020. And um, one of my dancers uh, got refused uh, visa entry. And so we're flying over the Atlantic uh, to, to the West Coast, actually. We're doing a sort of three week tour down the West Coast. And I realized that I've only got four cast members. The show's called Five Soldiers. We're in America. There's no excuses, you know, there's no excuses. So I sat there and I suddenly dawned on me like, and I wasn't, I mean, I was still dancing, I was teaching class, but I was absolutely not fit. I was not like in a, I was not in performance mode whatsoever. I hadn't mm. been, I, I mean, I'd given up for about seven years then. And um, I was like, right, um, I'm going to have to be the fifth soldier and we're going to have to rework the show on the flight over. Mm. Um, so, we did, so we did that and I, I got to the hotel room and I just did drill all night because there's this four minute of deadly drill that is just like absolutely like if you get it wrong it's just the worst thing in the world and, and, and you have to get it right and I did one week of shows in Sacramento at the Mondavi Centre and still the dancer couldn't get out and then I did another week of shows in San Diego and finally the, the fifth dancer appeared but there was something in, there was one night in San Diego. These, so this is a show made for 20 year olds. This is not a show made for women of my age. <laughs> like, like you are hitting the floor and getting up and hitting the floor and getting up and pouring with sweat and everything. But That's there was what, I, one I thought night, that as I was, I was like, yeah, this is not, I would not be doing this shit. Like not, not at my age. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You know, I, I, I've had like you know multiple operations. I'm like, oh, but you got to You got to go for it. And there was one yeah. night where I was just like, I was just power. And I realized it wasn't the power of like my body. It was the power of like me, like my a performer, an older performer who's performed for you know, coming on to like forty years. I've been on stage like, mm. like, and that was this. I, there's something lit inside of me like, oh, I miss this. <laughs> I really miss being the one on stage, not sat stressing about what the audience is thinking. Because when you're on stage, you don't care what the audience is thinking. You've just got to beat it. So when I came, we, we just got back uh, before the travel ban came in. Like, we just got back. But th they were literally switching off the lights at Birmingham Airport when we got home. It was oh, wow. ter terrifying. Got back. Lockdown happened. Couple of weeks. Oh, my goodness. We've got to homeschool a five-year-old. And I was like, right, I'm going to. I'm going to retrain, I'm going to start from scratch and I'm going to, I'm going to do a solo show, you know, because this might be a year. Of course it was a year. Um, and I got myself back to performing. So th there was a moment um, in mid 2020 when JK Rowling wrote her essay and I'd, I'd already been working and, you know, recording, sound, recording speech and writing scripts and then improvising to it. it Sometimes like I wrote these awful long essays and it was, oh, it was awful. And then do these terrible dances. Oh, you know, it's like, okay, bit by bit. And then J.K. Rowling put her essay out and it was so close to what I was trying to say with my work mm. that I was just kind of like, yeah, this is, this is the moment. This is the moment. Women just, this is still a taboo women talking about how much happens to them, not because of their identity, right. but because we have, we, have, we have biological vulnerabilities. We do, if you, you know, and, and there's all sorts of strange conditioning that you justify to yourself when you're a young woman and you say, no, I'm free, I can do this. And then it's only as you get older and you realize it's happened to all your female friends of mm. a certain age. And you look and you say, that's what happens to young women. And that happened to me. And 
I can't deny it. Yeah, I mean, because there, there's just stuff that uh, I mean, it's deeply autobiographical. And again, I'll leave I'll leave a link to this um, in the show notes below so people can watch it. Um, and again, you know, and I was so affected by it, you know, as because as a man, it's like, yeah, wow, I have no idea, you know, maybe I've maybe I've been someone who because you know, I mean, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, men, we're motherfuckers, you know what I mean? We're motherfuckers to each other and to everybody else. Um, but it was such a um, it was such a, a, a just a powerful experience that uh, that and and right now we're operating in uh, in an environment where people are actively working to rob um, rob someone like me that could learn a lot and that could be sort of have my mind shifted my my heart kind of shifted um, we're creating an environment now where people are sort of actively working against um, pieces like yours that could really um, shift the conversation in a way. And um, it's it, it, it they, they but they can't see the forest for the trees, because they're sort of possessed by this idea that they're, you know, changing the world, and they're gonna, um, uh, you know, they're, they're doing the right thing. And, you know, you can't doubt their sincerity. And in, in most cases, I think, but uh, it's just it's an it's a but you're there. It's it's weird. I'm like, it's, it's I don't want to it, it, I have no words, you know, <laughs> I can't even because it, it, it just makes me it's, it's crazy making and um, there seems to be no way out of it. But, you know, and there's so much more I want to say, but I try to keep these things to about an hour. So the last thing uh, I guess the, I'll switch to. Oh, well, I could talk to you forever. I can tell already. Like if we if we were in school together, we would have to be separated because we just be fucking around the whole time. Um, I, I get that. I get that vibe from you. But um, no, I've been trying. I've been trying to teach you the splits. I, I know. <laughs> Come on, get down. Mm, <laughs> get, get, get the fuck away from me. Um, but my body just doesn't do that. Although I will say, so it's so it's so hilarious. So I, I lived with. Um, uh, when I was in Harlem, I lived with two Alvin Ailey dancers, and uh, oh, wow. and 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 they were, I mean, incredible, incredible company, and uh, you know, but they were always like walking around in various stages of pain and soreness, um, but just beautiful, beautiful people. And I remember, you know, I was also doing the shows. One of the shows I was talking about earlier, where I, you know, where I was an actor being called upon to dance. Um, there was a show called Kung Fu. Actually, it was a it was a bio play of Bruce Lee. It was really fascinating. And so we had these uh, dancers who were doing like, you know, just these crazy fights and, and choreography. And um, it was Sonia Taye, I think, who did who did the uh, choreography. Mm -hmm. And um, there was, you know, early on, the sort of workshops and everything. I'm like trying to do backflips and all this other crazy shit that, that these dancers are doing. And, you know, and I'm like, a, I'm a big dude. And these guys are all wiry and, just, and making it really look easy and everything. And um, and at a certain point, I said, man, come on, man, I'm like six, three. I can't do this shit. And then. <laughs> <laughs> one of these alien dance, like one of the lead, I think, male alien dance, who's like six four, jacked, yeah. comes in. I watched him on stage. He's just doing all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, I'm like, all right, that's just I'm not a dancer, <laughs> and that's okay. It's really okay. Yeah, but but that's the thing. It's like, it's like look, you know, dancers can't act either. Like like what you have to do is get dancers to sort of find a bit of themselves to kind of like yeah, fill and then fill their brains with with all sorts of, you know, imagery and, you know, you, it's really hard that they're two completely separate worlds entirely. I think, I think you have to sort of think about yourself and your body in almost opposite ways, I think. Well, it's really weird because, I mean, because we're still storytellers at the end of the day. Yeah. And, um, and it's, and it's because I've, you know, like the, the bane of my existence would be like a Broadway dance callback, you know, or any dance callback, because yeah. I'd, I'd be in there, because not, not, I mean, they, they'll be gentle a lot of times that like they will, um, They'll separate, you know, they, they categorize people and actors into like dancers and movers. I worked with an yeah. actor once who, uh, who who joked, he said, yeah, man, I'm a mover. When the dancing starts, I move out the way. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I'd be in there sometimes with these lines, you know, guys who are like my height doing backflips and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'm just like, this is so embarrassing right now. But I, but I would always wonder, you know, because then the choreographer would get up there and be like, and five, six, seven, eight, and da, 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 da. And these, and these people will just re repeat the, the combination. And I'm I like, know. what, how do you do that? But then, you know, I remember I was trying to coach um, a, a dancer that, um, that uh, had, had, she was subletting, you know, replacing, because one of the other, Al, the Ailey dancers was on tour. And uh, so she was there, this lovely, lovely young lady. And um, she was auditioning for some, some play. And I was, tr I had such a hard time trying to translate to her what I do, 
you know, just to try to help her get through this scene. And I was like, it's so funny because I'm watching dancers being like, how are you doing that? And but they're, they're looking at me like, how are you doing that? <laughs> it's just it's hilarious. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, to go back to your point, I mean, I mean, I mean, like I said, with the sort of tip of the iceberg, I, I am surprised. I'm really surprised because the arts are full of so many intelligent, articulate, really thoughtful people who look at the world and research the world. Mm -hmm. And they're either they're either swallowed up by this and also believe it or they are just so so self-censoring I don't know how on earth they can work it must be really painful actually must be and I find this like just completely heartbreaking I, I mean like you I don't know I don't know what my future is anymore because I, I, I'm I'm out on a limb here at the moment I mean there's another crowd of amazing artists in, you know across the world and people that understand free speech and freedom of expression and people in other countries rather than the UK that also recognize that like freedoms are really hard to, to gain and very easy to lose. And once you've lost them, yeah. you lose them for, for generations. And, and I feel like this canary that's been, you know, calling it and just constantly getting punished for, for, for saying something that I think is really um, important and logical and without malice or hate whatsoever. It's done mm -hmm. absolutely with love and, and like honesty and it's like you're not i'm not allowed not, not, not to say this like but but where 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 are the people where the artists are the ones that are meant to be doing this please this is, yeah this has been you know the, the big big struggle of mine and um it, it's I'm, I'm at a point right now where um you know i'm, I'm just filled I've, I've accepted the fact that i'm just filled with anger just like righteous anger all the time um, about what's happened. And especially given, you know, what's shaken out during the, the pandemic, especially, you know, for, for me, I, I'm, one, like once I saw the Broadway community in New York City, one of the cultural centers of the world, um, they, they were told by the government that they are not essential. And then they, they agreed with that. And, and what's what's happening now is I see article after article now show closings show closings here show closings there they, they they're saying people are uh, they're slow to return to the theater afterward and I remember you know talking to people and be like yeah I think we're do making a big mistake by yeah. shutting everything down for a protracted period of time I mean bless Andrew Lloyd Webber he's one of the few people who was like no we need to open shows you know we have to we have to do our shows and. These people couldn't even see the forest for the trees. They were like, you know, what you're putting the economy. I'm sorry that you you don't you want to make money over saving lives. I'm like, no, well, first of all, what we're doing is we are saving lives. We're nourishing people's souls. And you're talking about Broadway. There's a whole economic ecosystem that people you know lose out on, uh, that the city loses out on. I mean, part and, and it's and it's Broadway. Like it's it's one of the central thing. Like it's a part of New York's identity. And you and That's you right. think that you're not essential. You're less essential than McDonald's. You're less essential than the liquor store around the corner. Are you kidding me? So I'm at the point now where I say you people are not fit for purpose anymore. You people don't care about about art. You don't care about uh, the preservation of it. Now you're complaining. I, I joke now. I say yeah you know maybe it is sour grapes i'm dining on a banquet full of sour grapes but you know what i'm washing it down with some sweet sweet schadenfreude right now because yeah. i tried to tell you people and you didn't want to listen and so i think to go to your question um you know you said you don't know what your future is uh it's just it's on us now people like us and you know it's me you winston marshall other people who are who are seeing what's going on uh recognizing the problems and um and it goes back to what we were saying before we got on. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of tired of talking about this, all, all this woke shit and anti-wokeness and uh, cancellations or whatever. It's just now we have to like build a new, we have to build new culture. And and what, what's been frustrating to me is that, uh, you know, you, you you need to have people who are of a certain caliber to, to, to do it. And it's, you know, that's why I'm so excited to talk to you because the things that you say and your sort of ethos and your aesthetic and your appetite for what you do, I'm like, these are the kind of people that we need to be building something else because these other fuckers right now who are trying to, you know, shut everything down, you know, for whatever reason, um, because they're quote unquote progressive, they, they ain't it. They're not going to do it. It's got to be people like us now. And that's, so that's what it is now. We, it's, we have to, we have to make stuff. We have to build it and uh, we have to come together somehow and uh, use technology and get it out there. That, that, that's, that's the solution now because no one else is gonna do it, frankly. No.
no 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 yeah we, we've got a we've got a big crisis in the uk as well because you got the, the the heating bill crisis cost of right. living so you got these big theaters that were never efficient um massive you know six times normal average heating bills um audiences absolutely not coming back but then also you know what are they programming um right yeah same thing on broadway yeah. same thing yeah you you got houses going like temporary dark um to save costs you've got also like a lot of the musicals shutting before christmas or shutting after christmas because the cost of touring are too high and yeah yeah i i, I kind of like you know i, I mean for me <laughs> I try and get in the studio at least twice a week. I do my ballet bar. I, 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 you know, it's like the discipline, just keep it going. Like, it doesn't matter. You do your meditation, do your breathing exercises, like write, think, read, you know, write funding applications. <laughs> Have lovely conversations, you know. Yeah. It's the world's, the world's going to change around or, or we're going to have to find a place where we're, where we're free to, to, to be. Well, you know, my my hope um, is that, you know, uh, there's enough of us that's that are going to come to the table and and create and we have these great this all this great technology now where we can share it. I mean, I was going to say this earlier because you, you mentioned it because um, I felt the same way, you know, at a certain point, I'm only working to in order to maintain my career, I'm only working to appease my peers. I'm no longer serving the general public. And it's so funny because when you see these people who are like, well, why don't we have a more uh, diverse audience or people, you know, that uh, an audience that's reflective of the world outside and say, like, well, you're not making things that they actually want to fucking watch. You're making stuff that you think is cool, but they don't care about it. Um, so my what I enjoy now, especially that I've been purged, uh, is that uh, my what I'm finding is that, you know, there's there's such a vast, vast appetite, a huge audience now for for just great, authentic, great work from artists who don't condescend to people. Um, and even if they disagree, you know, um, but but now we have the means to share it with the world. And uh, as opposed to keeping it confined to a bunch of people in Broadway or LA or the West End or whatever. It's, um, so that's, that's my sort of um, uh, the, the, the light of hope that I have now is that, you know, you, you, can, you can find people and get them together. Um, I, I'm still accruing people. I don't know about you, if people are reaching out to you, um, but it's time to people for, to, to, to start working and sharing it and, um, and share and, you know, because now it's not it's not really about celebrities anymore. People don't care about movie stars. You know, they're, they're looking at podcasters and YouTubers and TikTokers. Yeah. And I've had, you know, I mean, actors complain about everything, but I've had actors complain to me about like, yeah, you know, I screen tested for this role and like they gave it to some girl with like two million YouTube subscribers. Oh, yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, well, that could be you. That could be you. You know, and not to say like, you know, not to be in this. You don't have to be in this machine anymore. That's that's hurtling swiftly toward obsolescence anyway. Like you, you can build your own thing now and, and, and build your own platform and build your own fan base and, and change the culture in, in your own way. So that, that's sort of the, the ray of hope that I have. No, you're absolutely right. And, and, and I, I was thinking that, you know, it was already a little kind of kernel in me, but like listening to some of your talks of just going, yeah, hang on, Rosie, you were, there's a little bit of me that was like the good girl that, you know, wanted to get everything right. Um, but there yeah, was right. also like a bit of me that was just like sort of, driven by ambition, <laughs> you know, of like, of like what the steps were. And, 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 and I had to sort of do those steps one at a time. And, you know, and, and, and then once you let that go and you go, no, that actually not only does that not work and, and it isn't linear, actually it might not exist much longer either. Once yeah. you let that go, then I, it's like a kind of unraveling of an onion, you know. I, I, I mean, I always thought I was a little bit of a, an outsider. I mean, really, now I've been, you know, like you so uh, outcast and, you know, in the in the wilderness, wandering around in the desert. But actually, within here we go back to religion. Within that mm. time, that time, that that being in the desert on your own, you uncover new depths, new visions, a new future, and 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 maybe you know that's that's hopefully the kind of the, the the diamonds that will come out of this is, is is what we find inside of ourselves i hope so i think so and also you know just in terms of you know another frustration of mine has been that uh you know we get so caught up and i mentioned this you know uh, a little bit earlier too which is you know we get caught up in economics and policy and all these other things but uh, then we forget and we talk about culture war 
but then we forget about the art that the culture is producing unless we complain about how the libs have taken it all over basically and um it's i think we it's now um sort of incumbent upon people like us to just to you know have these conversations and and build stuff and just and keep going because i do think i do think we're having an impact and um you know, I, I certainly hope that uh, people are watching this and, and sharing it around and, and seeing what's going on. Um, hopefully through that, you know, we'll get more support. You know, I've got I've got people. It's it's, it's so funny, too, because, you know, in, in, here in the States, people are like, oh, you know, I mean, I think Stephen Sondheim at one point, at one, you know, I mean, I, I revere the man, uh, you know, just revered uh, theater composer, lyricist. Um, but he said at one point uh, that I'm glad there's no Republicans in our industry. Yet at the same time, oh. they they cast Republicans as like as like the party of like rich white men, and I'm like, well, don't you want their money? <laughs> if they're so rich, <laughs> like don't don't you need their money? Then what the fuck are you doing? Like you don't have to like them, but like take their money, <laughs> put on some shows, and then don't, then don't complain when your shows close or like your theater's not you know not financed and like you you know you're you're not getting audiences. Like what are you doing? Like what are you doing? Like it's for everybody. It's like art is for everybody. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I mean, I'm kind of like, I used to think that I was a bit of a political artist, but now I'm like, oh, please, can we just take the politics out? Because I, I really, I, I think the definitions of left and right are, are, are starting to become slightly meaningless in the UK yeah. and, and, and the US. I'm, I'm kind of moving away from from that because it, 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 it yeah, it doesn't make any sense. And and if you if you allow any politics to overwhelm an entire body of the arts, you're turning it, I mean, it basically becomes propaganda. And it's right. that thing that you're asking right at the start, like, like, how can you tell what real dancing is? It's like, how can you tell what real art is? You know it. You know when it's mm. not real. You know when it's propaganda. Yeah. You know, you can, it, it smells. And, and, and that's where we are. You cannot let ideology overrule, you know. I was thinking also, like, you know, things like, like Henry V, that, you know, um, mm. I didn't understand that until I'm old enough. And have gone through enough to, to to go. Good God, you know, if you put yourself in the arena, you're gonna get shot at. Like that's what mm. happens. It's how you deal with it. And and I thought I had been, you know, like oh, I had a terrible injury. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like this is these these are these are important times. These are difficult times. They're important times. And you're either in it, or or I mean, where do you where do you hide? They will come and find you. They they yes. can. I mean, I literally I have like some friends. Um, that, that support me but can't publicly and they get caught out by like the wrong eye movements and they're under investigation or something wow. you know you 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 will get caught out for wrong thing That's so you like, better to come out just just do it i mean i know you said you listened to um uh, the talk i had with mary mcdonald lewis uh, uh that i that i just had you know it was just brilliant she's like you know just just get called names whatever just just go through the that. fire you know, just 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 do it and stop. Because guess what? You know, like you're still alive. You'll still be fine. And it's funny because people call. You know, they they look at me. They're like, "Oh, you're so brave." Yet I'm like, I don't think so because I feel like the majority of people actually agree with me. So I'm not. I don't think I'm saying anything that's you know really sort of outrageous or whatever. Um, you know, or, or taking a really bold stance on things. I'm like, no, it's just reality, and I'm just calling out what I think is bullshit. Um, and I think. I just I get I get sort of not sort of but I get really annoyed now with people who I see them post online about like oh you know I'm in this show da, 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 da. but then privately it's like I just can't believe these people I can't da, 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 da. I'm like well we'll fucking say something then if more yeah. people got up and said something then we wouldn't be in this position but people are so ignorant as well because I mean you made me think about um work with this one uh um established like award-winning actress tony winning actress uh, moving on into direct in, into directing and i was having this phone conversation with her and this was in the wake of you know i don't i know like the i know the racial stuff isn't as as bad um in the uk although i i joke all the time like i apologize like whatever we flush down the cultural toilet here seems to like wash up overseas so i apologize to my my my, uh, my british colleagues out there but um you know, in the wake of all the uh, the George Floyd unrest and all the racial unrest and all this stuff, you know, I was talking, you know, it just, it swept through um, the the American theater. Like all of a sudden, now me, I'm someone who's been encouraged from since I was 17 years old that, you know, if you work hard, you, you know, you're gonna have a long career. You're very castable, you can do this, you can do that. 
And, you know, that's people believed in me more than I believed in myself. So imagine my shock, Rosie, when I learned that the industry is racist um, and needed to be reformed from the from the ground up with these sort of anti-racist um, cultish um, uh, ref, uh, attitudes. And, um, you know, I, I just <laughs> oh, shoot, I, I lost my train of thought where, where I was going with that. Oh, um, fuck. Well, I, yeah, uh, the, the George Floyd, but the thing is, it's oh, like, oh I, know, I know what it was. Sorry, facials. sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah. It go, was uh, go, so. Go. Yeah, I was, I was on the phone with, with yeah. this woman, and she was like, she was so excited about everything that was happening, and she goes, and she's, and she, and she goes, she goes, I just, I'm so excited about this cultural revolution that's happening right now, and I'm thinking to myself, holy shit, she has no idea what that term like where that term comes from what it is like they really are they really are looking at like it's a cultural revolution I'm like dude that happened before it didn't turn out really well <laughs> i don't know if you know this i know you yeah. don't you might want to change change your perspective on the, the the idea of a cultural revolution but they're but they're excited about, <laughs> about it you know what i mean like they, they're really into it but they but they're so ignorant they don't know that's the thing and then you you know you read these old you know you read about stalinist russia you read about Mao's china um you know i just i just finished doing a um an audio book um about this woman named vesper stamper um which she set in 1961 yeah. around the, the construction of the berlin wall um you know these these people they kill art they're anti-art they don't care about art they take out the artists first that's what they do but you people are going right along with it but you don't know that's the thing like they just don't know they're so ignorant about it yeah, I, I was doing um, some talks with people from the military, security services, artists and academics last year. Yeah, 2021 um, at something called Army at the Fringe. So it's kind of on the, on the umbrella of like um, the army and the arts. And, and, and we sort of helped set that up with five soldiers a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I was asking, like, like you know, what, 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 what do soldiers fight for if they're not fighting for, you know, values such as, freedom and civilization like you know how, how you know because it's, it's it, we know that like PTSD is much harder when a war has um less than moral reasons so there was there was a lot of PTSD after World War One and there was very little after World War Two because those fighting in it felt that they were fighting the good cause hmm. and I, I I was asking a, in a talk with um, a military person and someone that was in the secret services and their works in cyber security and, and, and an artist. And I was saying, you know, why is it, why do they target the artist first? And they sort of like, the artist laughed and said, well, of course we target the artist. You're the difficult ones. You're uncontrollable. You're not <laughs> normally motivated by money. You're motivated by something else. And you 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 constantly ask questions. That That's what, that's what you do. And the security guy, so, so a secret security guy, um, he used to work for the French Secret Service. He said, well, actually, we use um, artists as like a, a modeling across different um, countries. And um, when we spot, first of all, we spot that art, uh, artists get sort of uh, deplatformed or, or, or canceled. We see that first. Then we see their livelihood threatened, so they can't work. Then we start to see them sort of targeted or, or harassed. Then we see them getting arrested. Then we see them going into prison. Then we see them getting tortured. Then we see them getting executed. That, that's the kind of like, that, I'm sad, sorry, but that's the way it, it goes. He said, we're used to seeing that in really regressive, it, it's a sign that authoritarianism is coming in when they mm -hmm. start getting harassed and deplatformed and losing hope. Authoritarianism is coming in. And we, and we watch it and we measure it and we see if we need to put interventions in or, or, or start to make it a sort of global political issue if, if it's starting to go towards the really nasty end. We're just not used to seeing this ever right, in the right. West. We've never seen it in the West. And the thing is, we're so, I think part of it is that we're so removed from it, you know, we, because we look back and it's so weird, like during, during the Trump years, you know, it's, it, A, people just lost their freaking minds. It was unbelievable to watch up close. I mean, it was, it was so, did you say, you say it was funny? <laughs> yes. well, well, it's like Brexit though, in this country, it was right. like people lost their minds. Uh, I, I mean, weirdly, I, I think I saw Trump coming a bit. I could just, I could sort of sense it. I think it was like working with all these teenagers about conspiracy theory. I was like, something really strange is is going to pop up out of this. And there, and there, and there, Trump was. And then, of course, I mean, I, you know, we've toured to America quite a few times, and so I have some American friends. And also, of course, of course, 
being in military environments, I'm used to people with probably different political views than me and right. getting used to that years ago. At first, I was like, oh my God, you read the Telegraph? <laughs> and now <laughs> you read the Telegraph? That's hilarious. <laughs> and now and now, you know, and so I got I got used to discussing and debating and people disagreeing with me and me disagreeing with them, you know, years ago. Um and, and I'm I'm interested in people with, you know, I have a very right. good friend who explained to me why she thought Trump was the savior of America. And and it was like, oh, do you know what? I can hear you. I can hear what you're saying. I don't need to necessarily agree, but then I'm not voting for him or not. And then I think it's been, I mean, with Biden coming in, it's I, I'm not going to get into American politics, but my goodness, that's that's a whole other thing as well. Oh, that's just that's just depressing. Uh but but part of it is um you know, part of it is a reaction to the hysteria surrounding Trump. But what I was going to say is that it was so fascinating that everyone was so obsessed with calling him a Nazi, 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 and, and everyone knows who Hitler was. But then, but they don't know about like Mao and Stalin and 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 those people. And uh, they're they're so. I mean, I, I remember I was talking to one girl. This is a we were, uh, we were rehearsing something, and uh, she. And it's really bizarre because she was so clearly high IQ. It was really sexy, as a matter of fact. You know, like she was like just really, really sharp. But at one point, she was just like, um, "Yeah, you know, every once in a while, like just like world cycles or whatever." I don't know what, what the fuck she was on about. But she mentioned like she she put these two different things on a continuum. She was like, you know, there every once in a while there comes an era where there's authoritarianism on one end, and then socialism on the other end. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not. <laughs> That's uh, I um and I and I mentioned uh, like I mentioned uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. She had no idea who that who that is, no clue. And I bet if you if you know you take a survey of like ten quote unquote artists, whatever you know, maybe maybe one of them might know who Alexander Solzhenitsyn is. Maybe one of them. And um, that's part of the problem, you know, because that that's why they're so people like me look like assholes. But I'm like, no, what you're doing right now, what the, the sort of ideology that you're caving to that you're supporting is anti liberal and it's authoritarian. But then they laugh when they laugh when you say that because they can't see the broader perspective of it. They just they, they're just ignorant. They don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of can't work out what's going on, if it's the education system. I know it's ours. It's... <laughs> ours is trash. <laughs> <laughs> mm, mm, I, you know an identitarian politics collapse of religion collapse you know the birth of social media and the disruptive forces some kind of bizarre brainwashing that's gone through um because sometimes you, know, when you meet these people um who are believers um sometimes they recognize me and they they they, 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 they i can see them they kind of like laser in like <laughs> You know, mm. like coming for me, and I, I get very, I get very Peter Bogosian now. I get very calm, very, very calm. Mm. And then I, I, I let them have a go at me, and, and and then I will just because the thing is with people that are brainwashed is you cannot, um, you can't fight them with facts and rationality. It does, it doesn't, no. doesn't do anything, um, because something's really deep inside. So, so as far as I understand from deep programming, because I worked with some specialists when I was making a culture is you need to ask a question that goes in so deep that when they leave you, that question is sort of stuck in their brain. And it just, because the brain is an amazing thing and it will keep asking itself difficult questions if the seed has been placed. Hmm. I think they're on such a sort of front top level. If you're asking them the question, like can, for me, my question is like, do you, do you truly believe that humans can actually fully change sex? And, and do you believe that say, a child, say my child or your child, actually could be the opposite sex. And, and should we do that to them? Is that right? Is that right? Um, and just, you know, ask, just keep asking a few questions and see what happens. And you can sort of see them like, oh, you know, uh, one woman just sort of like said, well, I disagree with absolutely everything you stand for. However, it is wrong that men are in women's sports. I disagree with that because that's just not fair. And I was like, well, hang on, if you can see it in sport, can you not see it in like women in really vulnerable positions like at rape centers or women in prison that are locked right. in with a transgender prison or women in hospitals that are in now mixed sex wards when they've had really, you know, invasive surgery or when they're asking for female care. Can you not see that if you can see it in sport, can you not see it elsewhere? It was amazing. Like just to dismantle slightly 
some of these like 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 they're like pillars of belief systems it's like but no where did you believe that five minutes ago yeah hey hey boy how you doing um yeah you know i i i I've sort of given up hope on changing people's minds as far as the or the the culture and the the arts, but uh, I, I I do think that we have to leave it there because uh, I, I I got a I got another interview that I have to jump on, and I feel like I could talk to you forever and ever and ever in a day. I gotta I gotta have you back on, or maybe even meet you in person, and uh, you know, because there's actually a lot a lot more. I had like a list of things and thoughts that I had to to share with you and, and ask you about, but uh, in the meantime. Uh, how and you know and you always want to leave them wanting more in show business um so how can people find and support you rosie because you deserve to be uh found and supported by good people oh, fantastic I, i've got a website um it's k-2 co so k2co.com i'm on twitter as rosie k k2 co and on instagram and on facebook so so they just Google Rosie K and I'm, I'll hopefully show up somewhere along with articles. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you, you're, you're my favorite uh, adult female dancer uh, that I've ever met. So thank you for coming on. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. It's a life affirming chat. So yeah, I was looking forward to it. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you.